Vibrato. Yes, when are we introducing vibrato? Well done. What are we doing during book two, Joe, that is connected? Uh, should be. Excellent. Um, right, so I'm going to go through the exercises that I use and we will kind of do them. Um, yeah. <laughs> is that all right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, so the first thing we do when we're looking to do vibrato, and I will give you some idea of how long my students tend to take on each bit, but obviously it's flexible because it depends how much practice they do, how easy they find it, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, no violins, please. Find a space next to a wall that you are comfortable and imagine the size of your violin so that, if you're, so that your scroll would be on the... Wall. Actually, you should not have to. Oh, watch, maybe. You shouldn't. Neither should be a problem, really, because what we're going to tap on the wall is this row of knuckles. Yeah? So, what you're trying to do is um, you are trying to make an even tapping. You're using your bicep and your tricep, give them a little feel. Can you feel them firing up? If you can't, then something is interesting. Uh, Devon, just stand more with your back to me, you might want to go over there so that you can see us instead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and we want curled fingers, relaxed thumb, and we're going to sing Nelly the Elephant. Ready? Go. Nelly the Elephant, 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 Nel
Um, some children just sweat through their fingertips a lot anyway. I've got one kid who's, you know, there's always just little patches of damp on the fingerboard. Um, and, you know, I just say to her, well, you just have to wash and dry your hands a bit more often. But, you know, she's 13 doing my folio, so it hasn't held her back. <laughs> um, uh, and we want to check that this, you know, that this isn't waggling about. Uh, and you might want to kind of poke them in the big muscles, the bicep and the tricep, so because that, that's literally like those are the ones that they need to move. And what they often think is this, so then they kind of get like distracted by the by the forearm. And if they're finding that very difficult, they can even practice doing it in the air. I mean, obviously it's the same as the Nelly knocks, right? But just actually probably not even that much bigger. A little bit bigger maybe. Well, yeah. It's not bigger and get smaller, I guess. So they yeah. understand the concept. Yeah. Good, so you're just checking that this is all fine, that they can get up and down, that they can keep the finger on the string but on the top, and I call that polishing. Uh, and then let's do one more and then I will can write those. Do it with the different fingers then? Uh, can you, no, I, I am of the school of thought that once you get vibrato on a three, you can try the other fingers and it tends to work rather than trying to do them all on those different fingers. I think because it's on vibrato and the three is sort of the middle of, well, two is obviously more the middle, well, no, just no, as much, right. not the middle. Mm. <laughs> but um, I think the three keeps the wrist in the right position as well, whereas two, I would worry you could have the four too far away from the string. And one just would make it too tense. So the next exercise, and then we'll do some writing up, is just to check that they've got a mobile left elbow, and it's left hand pizzicato. So we're plucking E and G with a four, four times. Three, four, and then plucking with the three. So it sounds the same, but they change the finger each four sets. And go to two. Exaggerated left elbow movement. It's too big. Why do you need that? Um, just so that if they if they if they're tense with the elbow where it is, everything is going to be harder. So it's just a freeing exercise. So let's write those three up. So we have the Nelly Knox. Check that your violin's width away from the what well, length away from the wall, and do make sure they understand they should sing all of it because that is seventy two knocks, I think. Um, is it 26? Is it 26? I think. 24 in each yeah. variation. No. And only the other bit six, so no, it's not even that. It's 150. So it's a good amount. So no, they're not, and they can do it to the music. And also what will happen when they do that, which won't happen with you because you're not learning the vibrato for the first time, is that as they do it, they start off totally fine, and then it starts to kind of go a bit mad. And that's because that's what happens when your muscles are moving from the, if you think about the three C's, moving from cooperation, I can do this, into consolidation because you can make your body do something a few times and then once the muscle gets tired it starts to malfunction and that's why there's 10,000 repetitions between cooperation and consolidation. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Do you want me to write it up? So the staircase of learning is the three C's. This is comprehension, cooperation, Consolidation, also known as what does Ed Crichton call it? Ah, uh, what's the word that the C that he uses? Something repetition, constructive repetition. I prefer consolidation because it's neater. Um, so comprehension. I understand what I'm supposed to do. Maybe I can't do it, but I understand. I understand that vibrato is an arm movement when my wrist is supposed to stay still, for example, right? Cooperation, I can do a few of them. I can make my body cooperate with my mind and do it. 
consolidation, I can do it without thinking. And this is where the 10,000 repetitions happen. Thank you, Joel. So we have the Nelly Knox, and then we have polishing. And you know, lots of my kids love anything to do with the phone, so we use a stopwatch and do 60 seconds of polishing. Or they do 50, uh, have a break after 25, and then you know, do another 25, or they do it while they listen to their favourite Suzuki piece. You know, look, there are loads of ways that you can make them do it lots of times. Basically, it's not just 10 times. Like, you're not going to get through 10,000 repetitions very quickly if you're only doing 10s at once. And then the left hand hits Carto to check that the left elbow is mobile. And the other benefit of that is that they're practicing this with each finger. And that is part of what will happen in vibrato is that the finger will open and close and shape. Mm. So what do we call this? Um, left hand hits Carto. Hand at ankle. Hit E, G. Four on E. Four on, well, four E, G's. Times four on each finger. interchangeable in terms of order we do finger gym and I just get them to do both hands at once because it's useful for finger flexibility in the right hand it's easier to do the same thing with both hands um, and yeah those are the two reasons for doing both of them so put your hands like you're holding a book very thin And then you're going to make a square or a line with your first fingers and point them towards each other, pull them back to the square and then point them up. So square, out, square, up, square, out, square, up, square, out, square, <laughs> finger gym. Up. Finger gym we call it, I call it. Uh, and we do 10 on each finger and some of the fingers are much easier than others and then you mustn't worry about what the other fingers are doing. It's not to isolate the finger. Um, but just to make sure that they, they've got, you know, full range of movement. Threes tend to be quite easy, as long as you don't worry about trying to keep the four still. And then four is also quite easy, so one and two are the trickiest. And, you know, I do say to my students, which probably their school teachers would not appreciate, you can do this when you're bored in maths on the third table. <laughs> or if you're bored in any, you know, do it watching the TV. It doesn't have to be part of practice, but it's also useful to have as part of practice when you're doing vibrato. Uh, square, out, uh, square, up, square, yeah. up, square, up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, you don't need to do it that big, it'd be smaller. Yeah. 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 But you want, again, you're always looking out for is there any waggling happening in the wrist or is the angle going? Because you want to make sure that they're keeping on, like I said lots of times before, one of the things that's tricky about violin is to isolate different muscle groups while you're using other ones. So in this case, we're using these big muscles to make the arm move and we're stabilizing these small muscles to stop the wrist moving. And that's quite sophisticated for some students. They can move the whole arm really well or everything is quite tight. And so for them to be able to practice it without making a horrible sound and feeling uncomfortable with the violin is really helpful for them. <laughs> All right. Uh, so next one, grab your violins, please, but not your bows. So this is sort of a combination, in fact, let's just put the violins down first of all. I don't always do this step, but I do always show it in the lesson, don't necessarily set it as practice. But we kind of find roughly violin position, and then you want to reach your other arm all the way over and grab your thumb, and hang your left arm off that thumb, right, so you've got a relaxed thumb. And then can you try the polishing kind of movement? Imagine that you're knocking your nelly knocks. And that will really isolate the thumb movement that has to happen when we do vibrato because otherwise the thumb is going to move up and down with the fingers. Yeah? So I don't tend to set that as practice because it's awkward and uncomfortable. Sometimes if they really want to do it, I'll get the parent to hold the thumb. Um, but the, the reason for doing that is then to get the violin, put it up, and you do need to, um, to just secure it here with your right hand because we're going to take the front of the hand away from the violin, so it's not like the other ones. So what you want to do is take the, take the hand away. So they might just need to practice doing this for a start. Most of them probably won't. And then with the knuckle on the first finger, you're knocking the E peg. Nelly the elephant, Nelly the elephant. And the thumb should be staying in the same place. And so you can see from behind that that muscle, that thumb joint is moving in the same way as it was when we were holding the thumb and doing it in the air. Does that make sense? Let me just have a little look at you all. Very good. Make sure you're stabilising those. So it's not that. That's me yep. and Nelly the attitude. <laughs> no. <laughs> They're doing it far too hard if that's going to happen. Very good. The thing you're looking out for is them coming down. One of the major problems in vibrato is that the base of the first finger ends up underneath here and then it's all just like that's part of what happens if you see that. So make sure that it's the knuckle, that's why the knuckles are so helpful, not the finger, the base of the finger. Yeah. Not the, yeah? Not the middle knuckle. Knuckle knuckles. No. Base knuckles. Part two. Um, e peg knocks, I call them. But you can call them whatever you like. Nelly knocks on the e peg. E peg knocks. Sounds like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> so let's write those three up. So that is air vibrato, slow bows with vibrato in the air on the left arm. You might need to get them to do tapping their heads and rubbing their tummy first. <laughs> I think most children can do that. Most of them are kind of interested enough in doing that in the playground or whatever that they've learned that already. But if they haven't, it's a good one to start with. Um, so what have we done? We've done Nelly knocks, we've done E-string, um, left hand pizzicato, we've done polishing, air vibrato, Holding the thumb and then the E peg knocks. Did we just do three or did we sort of make that was, a, that was the third one? Yeah. So, yeah, so I don't tend to set that for practice. And we'll talk about what I do with all these exercises afterwards. I don't tend to set that for practice, but it's just to sort of show them and make them have the feeling of freedom in the thumb joint. So, what do you set for practice? The, the E peg knocks. Oh, okay. But not this. <laughs> yeah. 
Because also, what ends up happening if you do set it so often, if you ask them to show you the next week, is they do this, and then that's not, you know, it's not. Maybe it's helpful, but it's not the same position, so it's more helpful to do it on the string. And make sure when you write about the E peg knocks, they need to stabilise the violin with their right hands, unlike any of the others where they can just have their right arm down by their side. Oh, finger gym. That was the other one we did. But we've written that out, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Is the pirate comes, this comes away? Yeah, for the e peg knocks. So I would say that those are the exercises I consider to be the kind of basic, not basic, foundation <coughs> exercises for before they're making any sound together on the string. Um, we're going to cover what happens with the next set next week. Uh, yeah, those ones um, I normally set once they're actually doing some vibrato because quite a lot of them don't need it. Um, but you can teach them that then. I would say when if you do do this one, it's quite helpful for them to put their finger below the thumb joint because the other thing that happens is that you're really practicing this if they do that and they can get really set in having a bent thumb that is applying quite a lot of pressure and if we think about what we were talking about last week with the thumbs you don't want the thumb to be opposing the fingers and you don't want it to be applying any pressure so if you if you practice them doing those um those sort of uh joint flexibility exercises either on the joint of the thumb or even below it a your fingers more curled which is more like it's going to be on the string and b it means the tip of the thumb is not practicing coming in like this do you, do you do the same thing if you're teaching little kids how to do circles do you do them down here no i don't i just do them like that but they don't do them very well um and the fourth thing is quite hard. So I think on four, they'll have to come further up the thumb. Um, but, you know, it's just something to be aware of. Mm. One, two, and three can go literally on the crease of the thumb. Um, when do you know your kid Seven. is ready for... On the crease of your thumb? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Vibrato in terms of how far they've gone with shifting. Like, when would... If you're not looking at the repertoire, when are they ready in terms of how they've developed shifting wise? Well, I would say if they're shifting reliably between first and third position without the wrist waggling about and without a lot of tension in the left hand, they could start vibrato. Okay. But hopefully they will have got to that stage you know, in tandem. I know it doesn't always work to, to attach other technical things to the pieces, but hopefully during book two, you will see, you know, that when they first start doing like the, the ghosties, for example, they might not be able to do it without doing that. Um, but as they get more practiced at that, and as they've had more time shifting up and down and at various exercises and games and things, that by the end of book two, they'll be ready, you'll feel that they're ready to start. Um, why do you teach arm vibrato first? Because it's the same movement as shifting. <coughs> and how long would you do shifting? Yeah, so um, that's a bit how long is a piece of string. But I usually, I would say, set... If I have a student who is able to stabilise the left wrist, and so the big problem is not that this is happening, then I think usually it would be about a week on the first three exercises and then a week where we would drop the Nelly knocks, we would keep the polishing and we would drop the left hand pizzicato. So we'd keep the polishing and then we'd introduce finger gym, air vibrato and uh, E string, E peg knocks. So the kind of second set is the second week but we keep the polishing 
Um, and then, um, then I'm going to talk about week three from next week. So, so what I usually, the way that I think it's useful to uh, approach vibrato is if you've got a child that you see <coughs> there's sort of this happening, you know, like they're, they're having a go, they're doing something, I think it's, that's a really good time to introduce these exercises because you don't want them to just work out their own um, unreliable way of doing vibrato. And if that's showing you that they're keen, and if you can nip it in the bud and show them the right things, rather than be like, you're not, you're not ready for vibrato yet, just don't do it. That's probably not gonna work. And if it does, they might feel quite crushed. Whereas you can say to them, you know, on the surface of it, for us as teachers, it could be quite scary to see a child trying to imitate a vibrato and doing it quite badly. Obviously, we don't want to say that to them. So what you can, turn that around and be like, I see that you, you, you feel like you're ready to start vibrato, don't you? Like you're, you're trying it. And they say, yeah. And you say, great, so this is what we're going to do. Rather than, oh my God, that child is doing some weird <laughs> jiggling about, uh, you know, and, and how we're going to stop them. It's like just overlaying with the things that you do want them to do. Sometimes that happens in the middle of book two. Some students you'll think, okay, yeah, so they're only in the middle of book two, but I think they could do it. And others you'll think, no, I have to keep it under wraps for a little while longer. And I think what you need to make sure is that you know why you need to stop them doing it. So if you can, and they need to understand that. So you can say to a child who might be in the middle of book two and trying vibrato, I am really pleased that you want to, to have a go at vibrato. What we've got to do is fix how your violin is held by your head and your left hand, and then as soon as that's fixed, it might be one week, it might be six months, as soon as that's fixed, I promise you I will teach vibrato, but until then, I want you to try really hard not to do the jiggling about version, because the longer you do the jiggling about version, the harder it's gonna be for you to do the proper version, and the reason I'm not just teaching you straight away how to do it properly is that it's going to be so much harder because of whatever you see in their playing that's going to make it harder for them. If you don't have a reason not to teach it to them, then teach it to them. It's not so fixed to the repertoire. If they haven't learned shifting, then, you, then that's what you need to say to them. You need to learn shifting first because it's the easier version of the same movement. But if they've learned shifting, even if they haven't done very much, if their left you know, side is well set up, if you see that they're able to isolate these muscles and not be kind of wiggling about in the wrist, then why not? Maybe they're on lully gabot. There's no real reason. And you know, for me, I feel it's self-evident that it would be sensible to teach a bigger movement first and then a smaller movement. That's exactly why we teach the outside bow hold and then the inside bow hold. That's how muscles learn, you know, like bigger movements are easier than smaller movements. But there are loads of brilliant violin teachers in the world who teach vibrato and then shifting. That's not how I want to do it. But if you've got a child who's desperate to do vibrato and you think, oh, I haven't taught them shifting, and they're not going to accept that shifting would be a good idea to do first, then maybe you experiment. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> but you know, I think when you, when you have those kids and it's often also older children who are not so far through the repertoire, but you know, they want to do what the kids the same age as them are doing, they see them in orchestra or whatever. You know, if, if they are going slowly through the rep, but they're well set up, ready to, to do vibrato, I don't think that you need to hold them back from doing it. But I wouldn't introduce it earlier if they're not keen. Because I think, for me, it's worked really well to have book one about violin, book two to be shifting, and book three to be vibrato, and then it all comes to be in book four. That just seems to me to work really well. And my kids are really good at shifting and really good at vibrato. And there are so many students in the world who are not good at those two things, even if they're really excellent at other things. Um, so I think um, what I'm looking for to move them from the, from the um, polishing or, or, or from these, the first set, is, is as I said that they're using these muscles, that they're aware of holding this so that it's not moving about, that they're able to keep the thumb um, loose but still connected, that there's no sort of, 
you know, that basically that's, it's fine, they can do it. They don't need to do 10,000 of those things. It's to, it's to take them on the way. And then the EPEG knocks, they will quite often do for two weeks. Quite often there's this happening and they haven't really understood how to isolate the thumb so that it stays in the same place. There's quite often that's when this starts happening and they start kind of waving. Um, I do say to my students, do you wave to yourself when you see yourself in the mirror? Like, hi! No, we don't wave to ourselves, so don't wave, don't wave here. But is that releasing some of the predation? What is? So, we're not waving to ourselves and looking this way, but are we still keeping a little bit of the rotation there? Keep the fingers parallel to the skin? No, I think it's fine. <coughs> it's not like this, I think it's fine. It's literally, we're just focusing on what's happening here for that. Right. And what's happening here in terms of stabilizing. <coughs> I don't think to practice it like that is going to help them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely passionate about not teaching a vibrato gap. <coughs> a lot of teachers will talk about introducing the vibrato gap. And what they mean is that when the children are playing, they get them to practice making a gap here. And what happens with that is that you get a very quick, very easy result of vibrato. <coughs> and it's all totally either huge or tiny. It's completely tense. It's just out of control. And it's basically like a spasm. And, you know, I haven't done a comprehensive look at the slow, you know, make them slow. But I bet if you watch that, Augustin Hadwig on you know a quarter of the speed that it should be. Every time you see his, yeah. every time you see his left hand, there is going to be contact here. So for me, when we vibrate, the contact points are the tip of the finger, the base of the top pad of the thumb, and the base of the knuckle of the first finger. Most of the time. Just a little bit. Not as much weight though. No weight. Yeah. No grabbing, like you could put a piece of paper there and it would just go up and down with your hand. It's not, it's not stabilising against that, but it's definitely not coming out like this because of the amount of tension that that brings. So think of freeing it rather than releasing it. Yeah. <coughs> and then next week we're going to talk about what happens when we actually start making sound and how you can really help them to focus on, in fact, that bit and it will make it work much better. Right. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Nope. Good. Great. Thank you all very much. Shall we play something to finish? How about tonalisation? Major than minor. We can think about our vibrato and the things that you like that you're doing and things you might think, oh, I'm not sure that I do want to be doing that <laughs> after all. Um, <coughs> when do you teach non on vibrato? We'll talk about that next week. So just pay attention to how much contact there is at the base of the first finger, what your thumb shape and tension is like, and, and what's happening at the tip of your finger.
Yeah. But it's already a type of square, hasn't it? Kind of. There's more of that happening. Yeah, yeah the others kind of go more to the side to side. And I think that's often where you also find that the, the base comes away a little bit, is for the first fingers. And especially if it's a low one, it's almost impossible to do it with the contact because there's just not enough space. It's all just mm. too jammed up. Mm. Good, let's have a bow. Thank you all for a wonderful day. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. So anybody watching this video, do have a look at the next one, which will be up in a week. Uh, vibrato part two. <laughs>